All right, so let's talk about gases. So obviously in this chapter, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, gases, which is the state of matter, uh, you know, where everybody pretty much has broken apart from one another. They're basically flying around the container. As they fly around the container, the gas molecules, there are several collisions with the container. That is basically what we associate pressure with gases. Uh, that sort of come from is the number of collisions that occur. Uh, the more collisions that occur with gas molecules, the higher the pressure will be typically. So more collisions. And obviously less collisions, we do get a droppage of the pressure there. Uh, what we will see here. There's some formulas, obviously, in this chapter that relate these things, pressure, temperature, volume, which are three common uh, sort of variables that we talk about when we are dealing with gases. So let's get into things that are gases. So under normal conditions, and when we talk about normal conditions, uh, we're really talking about sort of room temperature conditions, uh, 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, which is a unit of pressure. Um, we typically do not find ionic compounds uh, in the gas phase. Uh, they are held together by that really strong electrostatic attraction, the positive negative attraction uh, between the two ions. And because that is like one of the super strongest sort of attractions you could have, we typically don't see ionic compounds in normal conditions sort of go into the gas phase. So if you just think about you know, salt, for example, uh, if you have salt water and you heat up the water, the actual water is gonna evaporate off first at 100 degrees Celsius, way before the sodium chloride would ever evaporate. Well, you would have to put a ton of uh, energy in there to get it to do so. It doesn't really happen under normal conditions. What typically happens with ionic compounds is they'll just start to melt before they actually will kind of go into the gas phase and stuff like that. Uh, so we don't typically see ionic compounds as gases under normal conditions. Now, covalent compounds or molecular compounds where we have sharing of electrons, nonmetals and nonmetals together, uh, we do see them basically exist as gases. So there are some nonmetals that are just straight gases under normal conditions, things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen chloride, ammonia, methane. Not to mention, you know, some of the ones we talked about, like hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, chlorine, fluorine. These guys are also gases under normal conditions and you know, pretty much how they come. But different than ionic as well is a vast majority of molecular compounds are also liquids and solids at room temperature. The difference between an ionic compound and sort of a molecular compound is it is much easier to convert a molecular compound into a gas than an ionic compound. The most very common example is water. Water normally is a liquid. Water is a polar molecule, uh, which basically means the hydrogen side is more positive, the oxygen side is more negative, and there's an attractive force between those two molecules of water. That attractive force is what is known as hydrogen bonding. It is what is known as an intermolecular force. It is the force that holds that one entire water molecule together with the other water molecule. And that force is much, much weaker because it's basically holding two molecules together. So when we heat something like liquid water, we break this bond that holds those two water molecules together. The reason for that is we get steam, basically, water in the gas phase, right? It's basically steam will break apart and go into the gas phase. So much, much easier to convert a molecular compound into a gas than an ionic compound because really ionic compounds are held together by what are referred to as intramolecular force, the force within a molecule. And those are always much stronger than intermolecular forces. So the general rule is the stronger the attractive force between molecules, the less likely they will exist as a gas under normal conditions, because you gotta break that sort of bond between them to get them into the gas phase. 
the weaker that bond is, the easier it is to sort of convert something into a gas phase. So there's a lot of organic molecules like methane, for example, that are actually held together by very weak uh, intermolecular forces. And it's so weak that pretty much it just won't stay together and it will break apart super easy. And that's why we see something like methane as a gas under normal conditions, because it's very weak, weak attractive force between uh, different methane molecules. Now, substances that are found as gases under normal conditions, like I mentioned before, uh, are diatomic guys, are hydrogen gas, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. In addition, ozone is also a gas. And then obviously on our periodic table, our group eight, which is our noble gases, those are monoatomic gases. Monoatomic means they basically come as one. So helium by itself, kind of neon by itself, as opposed to our diatomic guys, like two hydrogens together. Um, that's how they normally come. So here on the periodic table, you can see these are guys kind of the purplish area are, are guys that are normally gases under normal conditions. Everybody else is kind of either a liquid or a solid on the periodic table. And again, uh, easier to convert those molecular guys. So this does bring up a good sort of distinction between a couple of words, and that is a gas versus a vapor. When we refer to something as a gas, that is typically something that is normally found in the gas state under normal conditions. A vapor is different. A vapor is typically the gas form of a substance that is normally found as either a liquid or a solid under normal conditions. The prime example would be what we just talked about, which is water. Under normal conditions, it is a liquid. It can be converted into water in the gas phase, which is referred to a lot of times as water vapor, as, as different than water gas, because it just sounds funny, but uh, they do call that water vapor here. Um, and it's because water is normally found in the liquid phase, but obviously it can be converted into a gas. Hydrogen gas is called hydrogen gas because it is normally found at the gas phase under normal conditions. We don't call it hydrogen vapor because it is not normally a liquid or anything like that. It is normally found as a gas. Any questions on that there? So one very important aspect of gases are really pressure. And again, as those gas molecules are flying around, they are causing uh, collisions. Those collisions are causing pressure. One very common way that we measure pressure is through a barometer. It's been a long time since I've been in your lab upstairs, but I believe most schools have taken out traditional barometers. Traditional barometers are typically mercury-based. So it has a pool of mercury, typically has a column on it. And basically, as atmospheric pressure pushes down on the mercury, the mercury in the column starts to rise, basically, in it. Most of the schools have taken out mercury a long, long time ago. So you may have some type of barometer, some like digital barometer, an alcohol-based barometer up there in the lab. Uh, but it is, was used to measure atmospheric pressure. Um, and there's a few different units of pressure that are very common. And for us, these are the three sort of units that we come across a lot. One is an ATM, which stands for an atmosphere. One is a TOR, which is named after the guy who invented the barometer, Torricelli there. And one is MMHG. MMHG stands for millimeters of mercury. And that is because, again, a barometer used to be made up of mercury. And on the side of the barometer was like a ruler where you could measure it in inches, centimeters are millimeters of mercury. So that's sort of where the name comes from, basically like reading a ruler as to how high the mercury is. If you ever do see a mercury uh, barometer or mercury in general has an opposite meniscus, it actually goes the opposite way, mercury. And you would actually read from the top of the meniscus is actually where you would read if it was mercury, as opposed to a normal meniscus that makes kind of like the U symbol that we've seen before. Uh, mercury actually does the opposite. Now, one tor and a millimeter of mercury are basically a one to one relationship. So if you ever need to convert from a tor to a millimeter of mercury or back, it's basically the same number, just change the number, the units. 
If you want to go from atmospheres to millimeters of mercury or tor, it is 760 is your number basically to do that. Uh, so if you have atmospheres and you want millimeters of mercury or tor, you need to multiply by 760. Gives you millimeters of mercury or again a tor, which is basically the same thing. If you're starting with a tor, or a millimeter of mercury, you need to divide by 760. So 760, kind of an important number. You use it to convert a lot there. And you divide by 760 gets you atmospheres. There are obviously other units of pressure, things like pounds per square inch, PSI. Uh, there's bar, BAR as a unit, like Pascal, kilopascals. But for us, in most chemistry classes you take, these are the big three atmosphere, millimeters of mercury, and tor. So those are the three big sort of units that are used. And again, that 760 number is how you kind of convert from one to the next. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Here's a much prettier picture of a barometer, sort of looks like what I did. Uh, but again, uh, you just kind of take the measurement there, you know, 760-ish, about what we are, a lot of times 750-ish millimeters of mercury. So when we talk about sort of gas laws, and we're going to talk about a lot of gas laws here in this chapter, there's basically three sort of variables that we deal with. One is pressure. One is volume. And one is temperature. So we oftentimes will, in certain cases, keep one of those variables constant, vary the other ones. Uh, but these are the three big sort of units that we sort of deal with in these gas laws. And uh, you know, depending on what is held constant, uh, what the situation is as to how the other variables will sort of change. So the first one we're gonna talk about is Boyle's law. And Boyle looked at the volume and pressure relationship and they held basically temperature constant in this case. And basically he studied the relationship between the pressure and a gas. And he found that the relationship between pressure and volume when you hold the temperature constant is an inverse relationship. So what that means is as one goes up, say the pressure, the volume goes down. And vice versa, as the pressure goes down, the volume will go up. So if we think about gas molecules and they're flying around, this really does make sense. If I had a container where I squished the volume down to this area and I had all my gas molecules in that very small area, I would expect an increase in the number of collisions, right? Because they don't have a lot of room to fly around in. So there's gonna be an increase in collisions and we would expect obviously the pressure to really start to rise. Opposite, if I sort of open up the volume a little bit more, give everybody a little bit more room to fly around in, what's going to happen is it's going to take longer for those gas molecules to find each other, to fall in the walls of the container. We're going to have less number of collisions that are going to occur, less collisions we would expect to see basically the pressure to come down. So that's that sort of inverse relationship that we see. Again, kind of like if we were all in a very small closet, the pressure would be very high, right? Not a lot of room to move around. Obviously we're in this very big room here. We got plenty of room to move around, not a big deal, not a lot of pressure uh, that occurs. So there is Boyle's law here, which states P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. And it's in a box, so I'm assuming you need to know that. I'm assuming. And this is sort of like a before and after situation. So all the ones are like before you change something and all the twos are you know, what happens after you obviously change something along the way. Now, in terms of units, the pressure can be any unit you want, as long as they are the same unit on both sides. So you got to have the same units of pressure on both sides, really for everything to cancel out correctly. And the same thing for volume. Volume, it doesn't matter the units, as long as they are the same volume units. So milliliters and milliliters, liters and liters. 
but you can't have a milliliter on one side and a liter on the other side. Otherwise, mathematically, when you do the math, it will not cancel out. So they could be any units you want for either of those units, but they do need to be obviously the same on both sides. And that's what we see here. If we look at a graph of pressure versus volume, we see that at a very small volume, we have a very high pressure. And as the volume kind of gets larger, we start to see a decrease in the uh, pressure here. It is such a nice relationship that technically speaking, if you took any gas and you took pressure times volume, all these relationships on this curve, uh, you know, they would all equal the same number. So if you took the pressure and a volume measurement for this gas, and then later took another pressure and volume measurement and you multiply them together, they basically will equal the same number all the way through, which is why we could get to the Boyle's Law equation of P1, V1 equals P2, V2. We could set kind of two different conditions equal to each other. So while we try one here, make sure an inflated balloon has a volume of 0.55 meters at one atmosphere, it goes up to 6.5 kilometers where the pressure is 0.4. Assuming the temperature remains constant, uh, what will be the final volume of the balloon? So take a couple of minutes there and see what you come up with. Uh, you will have several equations to choose from. Clearly now you only have one, but a good way to work them is to really just pull out the information from the problem and sort of label what it is. And you oftentimes can kind of see the gas law that you probably should be using. So here, when we look at this, we obviously have a volume that is 0 0.55 liters. One atmosphere is a pressure. So we have a pressure that is one atmosphere. It rises to 6.5 kilometers, which is useless information in this case. Uh, it does go to a pressure of 0 0.4 atmospheres, and we are looking for a volume. So again, if you weren't sure which one to use, you could kind of see Boyle's Law right there in your sort of writing that out. It would make sense, again, to use P1V1 equals P2V2. Doesn't matter which one you call one and two, it really doesn't matter, but most people just go with the first numbers as ones and the second guys as twos. So we'll do that. So we'll call these guys ones, we'll call these guys two. So in this case, we do wanna solve for V2. In terms of units, our pressure units are both the same. So we're good on that. So P1, V1 equals P2, V2 in this case, one is not hopefully too difficult to rearrange. We are looking for V2. By the way, another thing to keep in mind in terms of rearranging these equations is if you need to move something across the equal sign, it ends up in the opposite location. So although these are not really written as fractions, they are kind of like over one, which means I do need to move my P2 to the opposite side and it will end up on the bottom. And that would give me P1, V1 over P2 is equal to V2 in this case. Um, that means that we could put in our actual numbers. Our P1 is one atmosphere. Our V1 is 0 0.55 liters. And our P2 is 0 0.4 atmospheres. Again, the reason the pressure needs to be in the same units are because now they should cancel in this case. It should leave us units of actually liters here for our volume, which is okay, because that's what our original one was. So basically 0.55 divided by 0.4, going to give us a, we'll call it 1.4 liters in this particular case. Any question on the calculation there? <clears throat> now, important to understand the relationship we talked about which is in this case of Boyle's law, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down and vice versa. So if we look at our pressure, in this particular case, our pressure started at one, it ended at 0.4, that meant our pressure went down, which means we should see our volume go up. And we did see that we started at 0.55, we ended at 1.4. So. If you understand sort of those relationships we talked about, it's a good way to check your math to make sure you didn't actually screw up there along with the calculation. Again, if you ended up here with a volume that actually went down, 
something is wrong the way you rearranged it because that's not the relationship that goes with uh, Boyle's law. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay, so that is Boyle's law pressure volume relationship. The next relationship we're gonna talk about actually is one that deals with temperature and volume. So we're gonna deal with temperature and volume here. We're gonna hold pressure constant. And this is Charles law, which is uh, V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Now, a couple of things on this particular formula that's important, and that is <clears throat> the volume can be any unit you like, but the temperature does need to be in Kelvin. So it does need to be in Kelvin. And the reason for that is basically our good friend Kelvin recognized what we see on this graph that if you take any gas you like and you graph the volume versus the temperature in degrees Celsius and you extend the line back, every single gas all ends up at the exact same spot, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. 273.15 is the number we use to do what? Convert to Kelvin technically, right? Kelvin called that absolute zero because if we did convert that to Kelvin, we would add 273.15, which gives us zero Kelvin, which is referred to as absolute zero. So because of this relationship, um, pretty much it is a safe bet that if you are doing anything that involves a gas law and you have anything that is involving a temperature in a gas law, it needs to be in Kelvin for sure. And that includes any type of problem where they give you the temperature in Celsius and they're like, give me the answer in Celsius. So sometimes people are given the, the problem with Celsius and asked to give the answer in Celsius. So they think, well, I could just throw it in the gas law, it kind of makes sense. And you will get the wrong answer. So. You do need to take it from Celsius to Kelvin, put it into the gas law, get your answer in Kelvin, and then convert it back to say tricky question that sometimes comes out. And again, this logic, it, people think, well, I could just do it because obviously I'm looking for Celsius. They gave it to me in Celsius, but it absolutely has to be in Kelvin. Pretty much every single gas equation that involves temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So again, that is our Celsius plus a 273 will get us into Kelvin. What is the relationship that we see with Charles Law? Well, because the pressure is held constant, that means we do not want the pressure to go up and down. So if we increase the temperature, for example, will the gas molecules fly around faster or slower? They will fly around faster, right? If you increase the temperature, they gain more energy, which means they're moving faster which means if the volume does not move, we would expect the pressure to start to go up because there would be more collisions. So because we wanna keep it at constant pressure, the way it's able to do that is as the temperature goes up, so does the volume. So the volume adjust allows those everybody to have more room to fly around. What that essentially does is keep the number of collisions constant. And that's how we were able to maintain constant pressure Basically, the volume adjusts with the temperature so that we keep the number of collisions the same. Same thing would happen in this situation if we lower the temperature. If we lower the temperature, everybody would be flying around a lot slower, which means if nothing occurred, the number of collisions would start to go down and the pressure would start to drop. So what ends up happening is the volume also adjusts in this situation. The volume gets smaller, which means now we are able to keep those guys in a smaller area keep the number of collisions up and maintained, and we keep constant pressure. So as the temperature goes up, the volume will go up. And as the temperature goes down, the volume will go down. So as one goes up, the other goes up in this relationship. And as one goes down, the other goes down. And that's what we see here with Charles Law. Any questions on that there? There's also one that's very similar to Charles Law, which is uh, come here. Uh, Guy, Guy Lusick's law. 
And he dealt with basically pressure and temperature and he held volume constant. And in this case, we end up with a P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. Pressure is the P's in this case, can be any unit you want, as long as they are both the same unit, so they cancel. Our temperature, just like with Charles' law, needs to be in Kelvin. What we see here is in this particular case, no matter what the situation, the volume is held constant, which means if we increase the temperature, we are going to see those gas molecules fly around a lot faster, causing more collisions. And since the volume is not going to adjust in this case, we will end up seeing an increase in pressure. So with P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, where the volume is fixed, it can't go up or down. We don't get that adjustment in volume like we see in Charles' law. And we do actually see an increase in the pressure when we increase the temperature and vice versa. If we lower the temperature, we'll get everybody moving slower, <laughs> causing less collisions in this case. And we would see the pressure start to go down. So in Guy Lusick's law here, as one goes up, the other goes up. But here we're talking about temperature and pressure because we have a fixed volume. So we do see that increase in pressure. And as one goes down the temperature, the pressure goes down again. We don't get that volume adjustment that we see with Charles' law to maintain constant pressure. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> okay. So let's take a look at one here, I think. Maybe. All right, so in an experiment, 452 milliliters of a gas used in a light bulb is heated from 22 to 187. What is the final volume? So take a few minutes, see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look. So again, same approach here. Let's just pull out the information since now we do have got uh, several to choose from. Uh, we have obviously a volume that is 452 milliliters. That goes with a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. We got another temperature that is 187 degrees Celsius, and we are looking for a volume here. So again, we had our choices here, obviously a P1, V1 equals P2, V2, V2. We have our V1, T1 equals V2, T2, and our P1, T1 is equal to P2, T2. Clearly there's no volume or pressures, so that obviously eliminates those. And again, you could kind of see, hopefully Charles Law there when you just kind of label it out. I'm gonna call the first ones here ones, second ones twos. Do I need to do anything with any of these numbers? I do, I need to convert our temperature to Kelvin, right? So we're going to add a 273 to each of these to do that. And uh, that gives you some numbers there, 273, 460 on the right or here, Kelvin, and a 295 Kelvin. At this point, we're good. Uh, again, our volume can be any unit it wants. So in this case, it is going to be milliliters when we're all done. So we have V1, T1 is equal to V2, T2. In this case, we are looking for V2 to solve for. As I mentioned before, a quick way to rearrange is I need to move the T2 to the other side. It will end up in the opposite location, right? So it's just going to go up there to the top. And that would give us V1 T2 divided by T1 is equal to V2. We're basically multiplying it to both sides is essentially what we're doing there or just moving it up there. Any questions on that? The other thing that's important is we wanna make sure we actually put the correct numbers in the right location here. So uh, V1 is uh, 452 milliliters and we are actually looking for T2 up on top, which would be 460. And we're going to divide by our 295 Kelvin. Our Kelvins will cancel in this case and leave us milliliters. And it looks like here, 
we end up with a volume that is 705. And again, the units here would be milliliters in this case. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> now, again, understanding the relationship of Charles Law, like we talked about, what we should see with Charles Law is as the temperature increases, so does the volume. And as the temperature decreases, so does the volume. So in this case, our temperature went up, which means we should have saw an increase in the volume. And we do see that it went from 452 to 705. So again, it does make sense understanding sort of the relationship that we should see uh, in this Charles Law here. Again, it's a good thing if you have time to do that, make sure again, you didn't mess up anywhere on the math or something like that. It's a, we'll say a good way, but it is sort of a good way to sort of check your calculation. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. So, At this point, we got several gas laws. We have uh, our Boyle's law, which is our P1V1 equals P2V2. And that obviously is at constant temperature. We have our Charles, which is our V1T1 is equal to V2T2 at constant pressure. We got our guy Lucix here, which is our P1, T1 is equal to P2, T2 at constant volume. So of course, we should add one more to this list here. Our good friend that we talked about earlier today, Avogadro, he had a number, but he wanted a gas law as well. So Avogadro's law is V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. This is at a couple of conditions. This is actually at constant pressure and temperature. So at constant pressure and temperature, we get a relationship of volume over N. When we think about Avogadro's number from earlier today, that is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms equals one what? Mole, right? And that's what N stands for here. N is moles. And basically what we see here is basically as the volume goes up, so is the number of moles sort of proportional to each other. And as they go down, so does the uh, number of moles actually goes down as well. So this is like any of the other sort of gas laws there. You can obviously solve for volume, you can solve for moles in this case. Um, we'll add our other things up here just to keep a running list of stuff we talked about here. One atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury and 760 tor. So again, with these gas laws, you know, you want to kind of choose whatever one sort of fits the information that's given to you. Now, taking together all of these here that we've talked about, Boyle's, Charles, Guy Lucic, Avogadro's law, we do get sort of the granddaddy of them all, which is the ideal gas law. And that is PV is equal to NRT. And an ideal gas, is basically one where, as we'll talk about later on in this chapter, one where we take into consideration a couple of things. One is not really the volume of the gas itself, the volume of the container, and there's really no interactions between different gas molecules. So one major thing that makes something an ideal gas is you could throw a ton of different gases into the same container, and we assume in an ideal situation that they are like flying around by themselves, even though there's other gases in there, they really won't interact with each other under normal conditions or ideal conditions. And that's really what an ideal gas is. And uh, that comes in handy later on when we do a certain type of calculation, when we got lots of different gases in there, uh, is this our ideal thing. The ideal gas law is different than all the ones we just saw in a couple of situations. All the ones we just saw were like a one and two, like a before and after type situation, two different conditions. This is like a one and done situation. The other thing is the ideal gas law is the most restrictive in terms of units. So when we talk about PV is equal to NRT, this is pressure and it has to be in units of atmosphere. So if you use the ideal gas law, the pressure has to be in units of ATM. V is volume and the units have to be in liters of, in units of liters. 
N is moles, so it does have to be in units of moles. And the temperature, like we talked about, does have to be in units of Kelvin. Now, all these guys have to be in these specific units because of what is known as R, which is the gas constant. R has a value of 0 0.08206, and it has units of liters times atmosphere divided by Kelvin times mole. So good news is if you ever forget what units everybody else should be in, you probably will have the gas constant given to you. You can simply look at the units here and that's what everybody else's units should be so that everything cancels. I personally use this number 0 0.08206 all the time because that's what they beat in my head and I can't get it out. But a lot of people nowadays will round to 0 0.0821. So you could use that number if you like instead. But personally, I probably use most of the time that 0 0.08206. Um, but a lot of books and stuff will kind of use the rounded number these days uh, along the way. That is a value, by the way, R, which is a gas constant, which means it's a constant value. It also means that you always have it available to you. Now, they won't always tell you in problems like the gas constant is this. So you just need to keep that in your head that you always have that available to you to use if necessary. A couple other important relationships revolving around sort of the ideal gas law are, first off, uh, we'll start with STP. STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. And when something tells you, a problem tells you that we're doing this under STP conditions, they are actually giving you both a temperature and a pressure. The temperature value that you use is 273 Kelvin and the pressure value you use basically is one atmosphere. So if somebody says in a problem, this is under STP conditions. Those are the two values you could use in the ideal gas law, if you like, uh, to solve. Now, specifically speaking, this guy up here is under STP conditions. One mole of any gas will equal 22.414 liters. So this is a very helpful conversion, but you has to be at STP. You must be at STP. That means that the temperature has to be 273. The pressure has to be one atmosphere in order for you to use that relationship. If one of those things are not correct, you don't have a temperature of 273, you don't have a pressure of one atmosphere, you cannot use that relationship. Okay. The reason you might want to use that relationship is it will allow you maybe not to have to use the ideal gas law. So in a uh, STP condition, you could use this relationship and maybe uh, kind of sidestep using the ideal gas law. The good news is though, if you can't remember that conversion or not sure if you should use that conversion, you could always use the ideal gas law no matter what the condition is, STP conditions, non-STP conditions, you can just throw the numbers into the ideal gas law and you'll get the right answer. But this one here is, again, specific only for STP conditions is the only time you could use that. By the way, when we do put all the STP conditions into the ideal gas law and solve for R, that is how we actually do get the gas constant value that we saw a second ago, in case you're ever curious where that value comes from. The pressure is one atmosphere in STP conditions. The volume is 22.4, one mole in the temperature. And that is how we get to our gas constant. So why don't we try one here to finish up on, calculate the pressure in atmospheres exerted by 1.82 moles of SF6 gas in a steel vessel with a volume of 5.43 liters and a temperature of 69.5 degrees Celsius. You still want to approach it kind of the same way we did the other problems. So what I'm going to do is just pull out the information. Uh, we're obviously looking for a pressure uh, exerted by 1.82 moles. So that is N is 1.82 uh, in a volume that is 5.43 liters and a temperature that is 69.5 degrees Celsius. So clearly we don't see any two pressures, we don't see two volumes or any of those things, which pretty much eliminates all the other gas laws, except for the ideal gas law, which you could kind of almost see here through those letters. So we would want to use obviously PV equals NRT 
Again, like most problems, it doesn't straight out give you R, but you always have that value as it is a constant. Now we just wanna kind of look and see if we need to do anything here. And like most gas laws, we do need to convert the temperature there to Kelvin. Uh, so we do wanna add a 273 to that guy, giving us a 342.5 Kelvin. The volume here is in liters, which is what it needs to be to use the ideal gas law. Obviously the moles and moles and our gas constant is what it needs to be. So in this case, PV equals NRT. We have V, we have N, R, and T. So we need to basically move this guy to the opposite side and put it on the bottom. We're basically dividing by V. So P would equal NRT divided by V in this case. At this point, we could put in our values. That gives us uh, P is equal to our moles, which is 1.82 times R, 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere, Kelvin and mole, times our temperature, which we converted to Kelvin, 342.5, all gonna be divided here by our volume, which was 5.43 liters. All right, <laughs> that is the liters will cancel. The moles will cancel. The Kelvin will cancel. That is gonna leave us just one unit left on that R, which is the atmospheres, which is good because that's a pressure. Putting all that together in there correctly, 1.82 times 0 0.08206 times a 342.5 hit equals divided by 5.43 going to give us a pressure of 9.42 and again the units here would be atmospheres any question on that calculation there <laughs> So gas laws, you know, you need to uh, know the gas laws. The best approach is really just to pull out the information. And oftentimes you can sort of see the sort of formula you should be using and it kind of leads you hopefully in the right direction. Any questions on any of that there? We obviously have a little bit more to go in this. And next week on their discussion, we will finish up chapter eight.